Thank you, Suzanne. Welcome everyone to the fourth part of our five-part APA DEI series. As Suzanne mentioned, I am Holly Judd, APA's Human Resources Director and Executive Assistant to our President and CEO. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming our presenter, Terry Doucher. Nash, uh, Terry is the Senior Consultant at the National Association for College and University Business Officers, better known as NACUBO. Terry has supported and coached leadership teams across various operational and structural transformations. She is a systems thinker who offers practical approaches to navigating the complexities of people and organizational processes. As a uh, part of APA's journey into DEI, APA's board of directors actually collaborated with Terry extensively as she led a two-day facilitation with our DEI task force. Um, a critical output from that effort is now the basis of APA's five strategic areas of the, our DEI efforts. I encourage you to um, go online and read the summary of our task force's work their recommendations and actions that now that APA is now undertaking. And this can be found on our website under the DEI initiative. And that will be accessible by clicking the about tab on our menu. Terry, we are awfully happy to have you with us this afternoon. The platform is now yours. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, and I've told everybody that uh, Holly will be here um, to help interrupt me if we need to. So mm -hmm. you are encouraged to put anything into the chat and I appreciate the intro. Um, so when I was asked to do this workshop um, and there was sort of a range of options presented to me, I asked if I could focus really on the individual, you who is sitting here listening to this workshop or attending the, 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 the session. Um, so when, when the title is Don't Let Reactions to DEI, blindside you. I'm really speaking to you as an individual, and all of my content is really intended um, for hopefully a, a, a focus on, on you as a person. So we're going to be talking about four different sort of areas or topics here. The first thing I'm going to talk about is our brains as individuals and how our brains um, influence our reactions and uh, manage um, uh, processes, manage everything about an organization, right? I mean, any organization we're operating in, we really are just a collection of humans who are coming together to figure out how to achieve our shared goals or outcomes. I'm gonna talk a little bit about organizational dynamics and how our brains can react to those dynamics. And then I am gonna share some techniques for how to navigate situations um, when we wanna improve our efficacy or just navigate challenging dynamics. And I have uh, some resources at the end that I know Holly is gonna post for all of you to access as well. All right, so this is one of my favorite quotes. Our brains are designed to keep us safe, not happy, right? If we think about um, just basic evolutionary human biology, our brains are designed to be scanning the environment constantly for things that we need to be aware of and to give us data about um, uh, situations that we may need to react to and to prepare us to react. So that's not to say as humans, we shouldn't strive for happiness. Um, obviously we wanna be happy as humans, but in general, our brains are not wired for us to like feel good and make everything okay. They are wired for us to be um, effectively monitoring and navigating our environment that we operate in. So let's talk a little bit more about the science behind brains because this is important in my opinion to understand when we start to talk about techniques for managing our reactions to situations that can be challenging. Um, so, so the amygdala is something that I um, have talked about for years. Uh, it was first introduced by an author named uh, Daniel Goleman widespread. It's been researched for years, but Daniel Goleman wrote a series of books on emotional intelligence and tribal leadership. And in his books, he talked about the amygdala, um, which is a part of our brain um, deep within our temporal lobe. You can see the little picture of it on the screen there. Um, and it, it helps us um, respond to situations. So um, uh, some people refer to it as the place that controls our mirror neurons. So, so if you stop reading for a minute and just pay attention to my expressions in my eyes, right? If I was to start to tell you a story about one of my former students when I was teaching full time, that is a challenging story. And I can actually start to get a little 
distress thinking about that student, some of you will start to feel that distress, right? Or you'll start to look at me and say, where's she going with this, right? Because your brains are mirroring my brain right now. And if I was to start to get a little um, uh, condescending sounding or sarcastic or, or you know, um, scoldy in my tone, there are people watching this whose brains would immediately start to go like, is this person really scolding me right now? Am, am I really getting, you know, getting, getting spoken to in this way in, a, in an APA presentation, right? And, and that's that amygdala part of our brain that is constantly scanning. And it's part of the limbic system in our brain um, that's involved with our emotional responses, right? And, and there is the behaviors that are primary for survival, right? It's how we make sure we are fed, that we feel physically safe, um, that we are <laughs> prioritizing caring for our loved ones. It's basically our flight or fight response in that, in that amygdala portion of our brain. All right. So why does this matter when I start to do a session on DEI and, and navigating our reactions to DEI? Because we are living in a world where there is a broad range of responses to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm working on a large project right now with 26 institutions, and we have institutions that are operating in states that are, they basically have been mandated and told we don't use this topic. And we have um, employees and colleagues that are on the front lines of doing work on diversity and equity inclusion. And we have people that are just part of our teams and our systems who are living and feeling this at a very personal and individual level when we start to explore issues of systemic racism and and uh, all of the challenges that come as we start to navigate um, um, equity and inclusion and belonging at our institutions. So I think it's helpful to understand this concept of amygdala hijack that I put here. So an amygdala hijack is, is an emotional overreaction or response to stress that activates our flight or fight response, right? It, it actually literally can hijack our brain. So if any of you can think about a situation in a meeting or an event where, where um, something happened and you could immediately feel yourself start to get tight or start to worry or get anxious or nervous, right? Or really start to feel angry or enraged, that's an amygdala hijack, road rage, sort of the ultimate example of an, amyg an amygdala hijack that can happen that triggers that sort of almost irrational stress response that we start to feel, right? And there's all kinds of triggers that can cause the amygdala to get, um, you know, sort of triggered or, or hyper engaged. Um, and what it does chemically in the brain, like there's science, they can put scans on you or, or little electrodes and monitor this. What happens when that part of your brain starts firing super rapidly is the frontal lobes, which are the part of our brain that manages impulse control, they actually get sort of shut down and that amygdala takes charge to help keep us safe. Um, I, I, the frontal lobes are interesting to talk about too. So I, I taught uh, for nine years at a university in New Hampshire and um, taught primarily undergraduates. I had some graduate classes that I taught, but it was always a good reminder to me that um, especially in male humans, the prefrontal lobes that control impulse control really don't finish developing until we're 25 or 26. So I would be standing in front of a classroom of 18, 19, 20 year olds and think they looked all grown up but the reality is, is that front part of their brain that controls impulse and helps them navigate life in a more self-regulated way really wasn't fully developed yet. And often their amygdala was, was sort of hijacking them and navigating them through situations in ways that were less than productive. Um, hijacks can absolutely result in inappropriate thoughts or behaviors. Um, they can be what caused somebody to say something impulsively that they probably should not have said. They can lead to, um, you know, all kinds of what we might cast as inappropriate responses, especially in the workplace, um, where we have kind of this intercultural narrative often of what's appropriate and not appropriate. Okay. And I think this is important too. After a hijack, people often feel a loss of control, shame, frustration, and those emotions can interrupt rational response. So, so when we have a hijack. Our brains actually flood with cortisol, they can flood with adrenaline, and all of those hormones then further disrupt sort of return to normal prefrontal brain functioning, right? And, and remember, all of this is happening in the background instantly sometimes when we're sitting at a meeting where we just felt attacked, 
or where we are watching two people behave in a way that is alarming to us and we're trying to figure out how we're going to navigate this situation and and sort of work through it. Um, you know, I, I like to especially talk about shame here. There's really fascinating research on shame and how almost any time um, someone is scolded or shamed, it really shuts down the learning centers of the brain. It shuts down the ability to um, help people hear what uh, what they may need to change or address or to be fixed. So shame is a whole other area of really interesting research, I think. All right, um, and sometimes the limbic system that, you know, that, that fight or flight response is triggered for a really completely rational reason, right? So sometimes when we have one of those extreme fear-based responses or anxiety-based responses or escape-based responses, it's not always the amygdala sort of fibbing to us or hijacking us. Sometimes it's a really rational response to really um, um, uh, scary situations. So I think this is where it's helpful to really think about how your brain has been trained or developed, right? Like what are the things that shaped your brain over time to respond and navigate um, the world in the way that you choose to navigate it. Obviously, we are all informed by our life experiences, the learning outcomes that we have from our life. Um, we are all affected by the evolutionary biology of the brain, our primal need to feel safe. All of us have deeply held beliefs that have been informed by our family, our culture, our faith, all of the different things that can influence and shape our belief systems and how we operate. Um, all of us have a need to be understood and seen, um, to feel like we are in an environment where people are really listening to us and able to connect with us. And, and most of us, pretty much all of us have a need to be affirmed. Um, and that can take shape in lots of different ways. Sometimes it manifests itself in a way to feel like I'm right. I, I know I'm right about this. I can feel pretty confident that I'm right, right? And sometimes it's that that ego need of, um, of you know, how do I how do I um, get the feedback that I'm looking for? And any of you who are leaders know that if you look at your organization around you or even family members. Um, individual people's need for affirmation can vary greatly. And I think that um, paying attention to that is important. Um, and, and one of the reasons I really like thinking about this list too is because I think this is a good list to help us start to understand what is unique about us and what is, is um, potentially different in other people. Um, some of you may be familiar with the work of Brené Brown. She has some fabulous TED Talks. If you don't know her work, um, I think she's well worth uh, um, uh, taking a look at. But by this point, um, a lot of people do know about Brené Brown's work. Um, and one of the core components of her work um, is about storytelling and the stories that we all tell ourselves in a given situation. Um, this has somewhat resonated to me with uh, family dynamics, too. So one of the things I researched a lot when I was in college, I have an undergraduate degree in psychology before I switched to my corporate life. Um, and I did a lot of work uh, learning about um, uh, family birth order, right? So if you think about the birth order in your family or with your family, if you're someone who has children, right? You think about in your family, if you have siblings, how every sibling sort of grows up in a different family. Right. I was the oldest. I had a very different experience than my middle brother and then my 10 year younger sister. We all grew up in very different families. And the same is true about organizations. Right. We all are operating sort of in a different organization. So if you take your institution, whatever school you're in, and you think about the people that work for you and with you, all of them are looking in at your organization informed by these things, informed by their own life experiences, informed by their own beliefs, informed by their own needs for affirmation and understanding. So none of us are going to see things exactly the same way. And building that sort of shared or common understanding, I think is one of the challenges we have as a leader, um, as well as releasing our wish or desire that people could just see things the way that we see them. 
right? That we, um, you know, learning to disconnect from ourselves as access or anchor to information or uh, access uh, to how we're examining the world, I think is an important part of development um, for all of us as leaders. All right, so that's a little bit about the brain um, and how our brains work at a very basic high level. Um, next, I wanna switch to talking a little bit about dynamics and an organization and how our brain, when it gets dumped into the mix of an organization, um, is uh, uh, potentially impacted. So honoring the diversity of our fellow humans, um, the need for equity and inclusion in the workplace um, is like a fabric in my mind. Um, and if we leave the diversity and equity and inclusion one direction, the fibers going the other direction are about the sort of three sides of this triangle that I have presented here. Um, at the foundation of it all is our individual selves, right? Those components that I just um, talked about. And that's a top level list. But when we think about all of the things that shape who we are as an individual, who I am as a leader, who I am as um, uh, someone who helps try to guide and coach other people, all of that is informed by, by me, right? But when I work in an organization, when I was um, working at Plymouth State, where I, where I taught, or when I'm working with other organizations, um, the other thing I really have to start to pay attention to is the concept of power and influence and how that factors into the dynamics. Um, so if I say to you, if I challenge you right now to think about your power and influence in an organization and how you think people perceive you in regards to your power and influence, right? Um, I think it's helpful to take a minute to think about the story you tell yourself about your power and influence. Right? Do that for me right now. Like, just say, like, when I think about my power and influence, I imagine that people who work for me and with me see me as someone who is fill in the blank. Right? And, and I bring up the concept of power and influence because I'm using myself as an anchor now, right? My individual self. This was probably one of the biggest areas that over my professional career, I had to really hit a reset on in terms of the stories I was telling myself. Um, I still remember early on in my um, one of my corporate jobs, um, I we did a 360 evaluation review, one of those reviews where everybody kind of um, goes around through the organization and assesses you. And I had always perceived myself as someone who was approachable and kind of informal and uh, door open kind of policy. And um, what came back to me in the 360 review um, was a very different story from a significant proportion of the people who were working with me and reporting to me. And um, uh, instead, I found out that I was perceived as kind of a know-it-all. Um, I was perceived as someone who was likely to interrupt and um, overshare my opinion before I asked questions of other people to really understand their opinions. And I was in a C-suite position at the time, I was the chief operating officer, and that because of my role as, C as COO at that time, um, that uh, most people felt like um, they did not have a channel or a pathway or a mechanism to question or challenge me. Um, and that was not my intent at all. Um, I am not somebody personally who carries a lot of um, beliefs around the value of authoritarianship. I tend to be much more egalitarian in my approach. Um, and it required me to really unpack the dynamics of power and influence when I was in a leadership role at my organization. Now, that's not to say that I needed to move the organization back to a place of of equity, um, obviously from the dis distribution of labor and to ensure that the changes were made, the organization was struggling at the time, I had to make a lot of changes. Um, and um, I needed to be able to hold my authority and make sure that I could still provide clear direction and, and make the decisions that were gonna fall to me to make. But I needed to do them in a way where I was informed by the people who knew the organization a lot better than me because they were on the front lines of work. And if I wasn't aware of how my power and influence dynamic and my brain, my way of being was impacting that, I wasn't gonna be effective. 
Um, and it forced me to really take a big step back and start to apply some of the techniques that I'm going to share um, as I move through this presentation. Um, and then the other side of the triangle, I think it's really worth thinking about is roles and expectations, right? Um, I think we spend a lot of time in higher ed, especially working in it. Um, we are often also busy. One of my one of my things I say a lot about higher ed is I think we we tend to be really good at overdrafting our bank of time in higher ed. And we're very good at managing our financial resources. We do not manage our time resources with the same level of stewardship and care and attention in higher ed in my experience. And I realize I'm making a broad statement. It is not true across all fronts. But um, I think that, that it is really important to have those moments when we are able to sort of move up above the day-to-day -day churn of the work and think about the roles and expectations that we all play and we all um, are setting for each other and how we're sharing um, those expectations. And I think if we overlay a diversity and equity and inclusion a belonging um, lens across all of these three areas, right? If we think about this sort of triangle as an anchoring framework to then start to apply diversity and equity and inclusion um, uh, as, as an area that we wanna really pay attention to, um, it allows us to start to have um, uh, more clarity on how we need to sort of unpack and work on certain areas of our work within ourselves and our work for our organizations. So if we think about our individual selves and our current um, beliefs and values that we hold around diversity and equity, when we think about our approaches to building a better sense of belonging in our team, we can really start to think about what has informed that in ourselves, right? Like, how, how did I develop egalitarian beliefs? Where did I attach to a sort of non-authoritarian um, uh, and un ultimately kind of unapproachable, unintentional um, way of being, right? Um, and certainly as the conversations about systemic racism, about um, uh, uh, white allyship around um, uh, uh, really supporting um, communities that are and individuals that don't feel seen and heard, right? I've had my own share of work to really do and will continue to do for the rest of my life. Right? Um, I have some fabulous resources packed at the end that take this to a whole next level. I don't have time to do a whole program on that here. Um, and I'm not the deep expert on that. There are a lot of people who know a whole lot more than I do about how we build a better individual self uh, to be present in the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But I have done enough at this level to know I have work to do and I still have work to do personally, and that work can help inform the work I do for the organization that, I, um, that I'm a part of. Um, certainly, I think it's very important to understand dynamics of power and influence when it comes to diversity and and equity and inclusion at every aspect of everything we do in an organization. Um, so much of uh, systemic oppression has been about power and who kept influence and really thinking about new models and ways of being and how comfortable we feel with them and how are we able to transparently talk about them and um, build shared understanding around power and influence. It's a big lift and something I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, and then roles and expectations. You know, what do we expect of ourselves in terms of how we behave and how we treat other people? Um, what do we expect of other people who may need to call us out on our behavior um, or share something that may be hard for us to hear? And how, if we are designing jobs and organizational structures and professional development workshops, um, how can we think through um, uh, diversity and equity and inclusion elements and even just the ways we want to treat each other as humans um, as we build out roles and expectations? Uh, uh, when I was back in a world where I was building job descriptions for people and um, uh, the last company where I had that level of, of influence and control, we ended up redesigning all of our job descriptions to have a sort of human engagement component at the top of them that set minimum standards for how we were going to engage with each other as humans in the workplace. 
Um, and it wasn't done from a sort of mandatory um, way. It was done from a perspective of saying that the minimum standard of work is that we figure out how to all get along, that, that there is no expectation at work that we're going to come in and be disruptive and make things difficult or painful or leave other people feeling psychologically unsafe or emotionally vulnerable. And in a really kind and uplifting way, we built some of those expectations around how we were going to behave towards each other um, right into the structures of our organization. And I think that there are lots of ways that we can impact all three sides of this triangle, um, both as individuals and structurally in our leadership roles, when we think about um, how to help people navigate the workplace and use their brains for good with other people um, throughout the work. So um, I'll start to um, uh, share some techniques that hopefully will be um, helpful. These are, these are all things that I still concretely use and remind myself to do, um, often on a daily basis, especially when I've been dropped into a new institution or I'm working on a new engagement. Um, and the first one is take a view from the balcony. And um, literally, it means to fly up out of whatever I am in and try to look at it from above. Right. Imagine that if I am um, on the stage and in the play and one of the actors that I'm going to step off the stage and I'm going to go up to the balcony and I'm going to try to watch what's happening from the balcony, including what's happening with myself. I am going to leave myself as an actor in the stage and I'm going to think about what is my brain doing right now? Have I brought too much ego to this? Right. Am I getting combative? Am I starting to take a position that I'm not um, allowing other people to voice their perspective, right? Or do I see somebody else in the dynamic whose brain has kind of attacked and co-opted the situation, right? Do I see somebody else who's trying to um, deal the amygdala hijack or weaponize something, right? They're trying to take data from the latest report or um, scaffold on top of a single event to blow up that narrative and tell a story that is um, their story or their version of what happens versus a more um, uh, neutral version that's informed by multiple perspectives. So that that balcony moment of forcing myself to sort of get out of it and work on it is incredibly, incredibly helpful for me as a personal discipline to monitor my brain state and, and navigate challenges. Uh, this is one of the themes that came out of Goldman's early work in emotional intelligence, the person who first broadly wrote about the amygdala hijack. And this is the concept of um, fostering curiosity and minimizing judgment. You know, uh, many of us have done the Myers-Briggs, and uh, you know that J um, is one of the, uh, the factors on the Myers-Briggs. And that's not to say that judgment is always bad. We always want to sort of, none of us want to be too naive. Um, we don't want to um, have those colored glasses on. We need to see situations with clarity. Um, but we also need to really stay curious about situations. I think that finding opportunities to ask people, you know, why they think about something or why they chose that path or um, to, to inquire about the context that guided someone in making a decision can be incredibly helpful. I know uh, for years I, I managed young talent, talent that was right out of college. And I think it's one of the things that made me a good faculty member at a university, frankly, um, is because whenever a student wasn't functioning well in my class or had missed classes or had really just blown themselves up on an exam or had failed to come to a series of advising meetings or an employee who just kind of, you know, ghosted me and stopped engaging with me, um, if I could lean into that by, by asking them to help me understand what was happening, um, and and really use my curiosity to, to do inquiry and try to understand the story they were telling themselves or the context that they were operating in. What were the things that had informed their brain to get to this point? I was usually able to come up with a much more effective solution. And I think it also helps the person you're engaging with feel seen when you leave with curiosity rather than question. And, and that supports the power of using inquiry to build understanding. Uh, there are fabulous articles uh, that you can find in techniques and training resources on the concept of effective inquiry and, and building inquiry. Um, when I was hiring, one of the case studies I usually gave people to do uh, around uh, interview prep was um, 
was a case study that helped facilitate um, or, or uh, lean people into inquiry, right? And and I could tell if somebody had gotten um, really curious and had started to ask a lot of questions or even came back with a case study with clarifying questions, I knew that I probably had somebody that was good at using inquiry. If I had somebody who very quickly um, jumped to a conclusion or figured they knew right away what I was asking, um, I knew I usually had to have some um, some conversations with them about inquiry as a skill or competency. And in some instances, it was a decision that led me not to hire somebody. Um, if somebody was too quick to dismiss inquiry and too quick to jump to conclusions or think they already had it all figured out. I think we can all build the capacity to um, tamp down an amygdala hijack, right? Um, that is actually a low skill. Our brains are plastic. They are constantly being shaped and changed. There's fabulous research on neuroplasticity and how our brains can change. Here's a story or an example that I used to use with my students a lot that I think really reinforces the power of um, neuroplasticity is, you know, think of anything that you've learned in your life. Um, so let's say you learned to ride a bicycle at some point when you were young, right? And, and your bicycle became a primary means of transportation. You think about the process of sitting on that bicycle and balancing on that bicycle. And you know, if you were like me, I can actually still remember my pop-up taking the training wheels on and off. And I'm in my 60s now. That was a long time ago. So clearly it was a core memory, right? And I can remember that feeling of joy when I figured out how to balance and then use no hands on my bicycle, right? Um, and so my brain had developed neural memory. It had mapped how to ride a bicycle, right? All of those neurons to repeat. And that's really what muscle memory is. If you golf, if you play a sport, anything we do, key padding, right? If you're a fast key patter, that's all neural plasticity or neural memory that has been patterned into your brain. Now, I also learned to drive a car, right? In my late teens. And when I learned to drive a car, a whole new loop of neural memory was developed, but I didn't unlearn to ride a bicycle, right? It's not like the, the, um, the neural loops that were created that taught me to drive a car swapped out the loops of, of bicycle riding. And the same thing is true for amygdala hijacks, right? When I say that we learn to tamp down amygdala hijacks, those Primal neural responses will always want to move to that part of our brain and cause us to go, what? Really? You did not. Or cause us to get choked up when somebody else starts to tell us a sad story and we start to feel sad too, right? Like that is the human part of us that allows to build human connection. But the hijack part, the part where we sort of become somewhat irrational, or we are feeling like we're moving to that place where we are not behaving as our best selves, right? That's the piece that we can learn and improve. Um, athletes often do this, right? Really good coaches for high-performance athletes work a lot to help those athletes learn to manage their amygdala response, those amygdala hijacks, so that if you just completely had a, you know, you blew up on the playing field, the play blew up, you're a quarterback, and everything just went to, you know, heck on the field. And and you're coming off that field and you're mad, and the other team just smack talked in your helmet, you know, on your way out and said terrible things to you, and you are fired up. You need to learn how to quickly reset that amygdala get those cortisol and adrenaline levels lower and be able to get back to your playbook and get focused on the long game. And I do think that that that, um, that ability to think about a long game, to think about your goals, right? To think about what are you trying to accomplish? When I was a teacher, my long game was how do I get this student across that graduation stage at the end, right? And how am I going to do everything I can to help them manage their amygdala and some of their prefrontal cortex uh, development issues that they were still facing, right? Um, how was I going to do everything to keep my head in the game and not react to their behavior and help move, um, move them towards that ultimate goal? There's all kinds of tips and techniques for um, learning to manage the amygdala hijack that um, you can find beyond those couple little tips that I just gave you. But... I think it is well worth being really conscious and aware of when 
you feel like your brain is starting to get into one of those modes and, and learning how to settle the waters. Um, the last concept that I think is really useful to read about, uh, and, I, and I have it queued up in the resources here for you to do more research about if you're interested in it, um, is the concept of personal agency. So, so the idea of agency or personal agency means that we have control or authority over something, right? Like when we have agency over our workplace, we are feeling a sense of responsibility to navigate and control our, our, you know, our daily activities, our minds, our bodies, and move ourselves through the work. Right? Um, when we have personal agency over our emotions, we are learning how to navigate and manage and control our emotions. And, and personal agency is something that in, you know, this is just Terry's world, in my opinion, we don't talk about nearly enough. We don't um, encourage other people to develop enough. And I might even make an extreme statement to say that I think we live in a culture now and there are lots of messages that we get that our power is eroded. Our power is taken away from us. Now, I am not saying that that is not a reality for some people, right? The reality is that there are a lot of people who don't have power and authority over themselves or a given situation. So I, I am not dismissing the structural reality of absence of power. But what I am saying is that within our brains, when I think about you as a human, right, finding ways that you can hold your agency and finding ways that you can help others feel their agency, recognize their agency, and have conversations as humans together about how we maintain and strengthen each other's agency is a really good way of operating and being, right? And, and I think that, that agency can also really help us understand that even the most challenging situations can be situations that we need to learn from, right? That those situations provide opportunities for us to be stronger and smarter. I'll anchor back to one of my um, teaching examples in higher ed. You know, I would often have students who might say to me, um, you know, well, this professor just is a, you know, fill in the blank, right? You know, is, is dismissive and condescending and talks to me like, you know, like I'm an idiot and I got no useful feedback on my last paper, right? And they would quickly want to give their power away to that professor who pissed them off. Right, who just made them mad. They were ready to go away. And and one of the best conversations I can have with a student is to say, well, let's think about how you don't give your power away because of somebody else's behavior. Right? How do you not blow up your GPA or or um, remove yourself from a potentially really valuable learning opportunity just because someone else has tried to erode your agency or undermine your agency? Right? And I think if we all started to examine and talk about and think about agency more with everybody who is in our ecosystems, and we had transparent conversations about where locus of control sat and how we were going to make decisions and, you know, sort of who was the driver of a bus on a given um, project or initiative, um, that we would find ourselves maintaining a much healthier and better brain state as we work through um, challenging situations, especially situations that involve diversity and equity and inclusion, where the loss of power through systemic oppression has been one of the really significant factors that we are trying to counteract when we start to do um, work around belonging and inclusion and, and equity. All right. So the last thing I'll talk about here is some resources that I queued up that I know Holly is going to um, share out on the website with you. Um, as I said, uh, you know, there are people who do this work um, Luke, a gazillion times better than I do. And they are the thought leaders and people who I really um, go back to and rewatch their tutorials and resources and read their books, um, you know, and um, uh, they kind of help keep me uh, both centered and motivated to do this work when it can start to feel hard and challenging. Um, one of the best videos I have linked here in the top is how to have a voice and lean into conversations about race. There are some really good pragmatic examples in that video of ways to engage with other humans and hopefully it'll make you think back to some of the brain stuff that we talked about earlier in this webinar. 
um, as you as you listen to that presentation. Um, I also put a couple links here to um, how to have uh, difficult conversations, um, a model to follow on that. Um, I put a, a, a link here to um, the contagion of emotions. I think if you found that first part of what I talked about at all interesting, where you start to understand the brain science of emotions and how we sort of all vibe off of each other in a room, um, the tone of a meeting and how we um, can set emotional tones to um, help support uh, more effective outcomes. That's a, a good video to watch. And then Crucial Conversations is a book. There's Crucial Conversations training. Maybe some of you have already read it. It's often recommended for professional development book clubs. Um, this is just a quick summary with one of those illustrated infographics about Crucial Conversations. But I think it's a useful, um, useful foundational reminder. And then I just put some terms in here that you can just go out to any search and find more information about. I put information in about, I put the term amygdala hijack. You put that in, you're going to find lots of articles and TED Talks and uh, resources out there that if you want to do a deeper dive on our brains and how to manage our brains as we navigate challenging dynamics, um, you can find that out there. There's lots of resources on cultivating personal agency at work, as well as on lots of other fronts. And I think any of us working in uh, diversity and equity and inclusion can also really benefit from reading and learning more about um, racial trauma, the trauma of systemic oppression, and how that shapes brains. Um, you know, anybody who knows anything about PTSD and the way our brains are informed over time through our lived experiences, as we talked about earlier, know that early experiences form and shape who we are. And, the long-term impact of poverty and of um, racial oppression or oppression of any kind, religious oppression, um, really is, is uh, significant to understand as we start to make sure that the humans we work with feel seen and heard and understood. So the resources will be available to you out there, as I said, on the Apple website, and I'm sure Holly's happy to point you to them at some point if you'd like to, you can't find them for any reason. Um, and so then um, last is just sort of my charge to you um, to hopefully keep connecting with each other. Um, I hope you find ways to create safe spaces to practice having really sometimes challenging conversations or joyful uplifting conversations with transparency to each other. Watch the video resources. They're really good. They know a lot more than I do. Um, and any of you are welcome to uh, look for me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Terry Doctor out there. It's a made up Ellen Island name. Um, so please feel free to um, search me, send a message if you'd like to. Um, I'm happy to connect with uh, anybody if you'd like more information or more resources about any of this. I'm really passionate about how we help each other get to be better humans in the workplace with each other. Um, so that's the end of my formal conversation. Polly, I don't know if we had anything in chat or if there's anything else that you want me to address before we wrap up here. Well, we don't have any questions. I think um, I would definitely encourage people to um, type in a question that they might have. Uh, Jacob just uh, is thanking you for the session. It was great. A lot of good information. I like the um, techniques that you had mentioned. Um, let me just, one person has a question. Okay. Kit Turner is asking, could you flip back to the resources slide, please? Yeah. And also, Kit, remember, keep in mind, I will be posting these resources separately from the presentation itself, because there's a lot of good information here that we can always go back to, to um, learn more about. And I will be, um, I like the hijack, the amygdala hijack, and learning more about that, as well as... Um, like Brene Brown encourages us the story that we tell ourselves versus the perception that we might be putting out. <laughs> it's very yeah, interesting. It's, it's really easy to start unicorn farming, as I would say, right? The imaginary boss I don't have, the imaginary job I don't have, the imaginary yeah. job I don't have, right? <laughs> Sort of part of the personal agency thing is sort of grounding us in our reality of like, what is the place I really work with and who are these people and how do I, you know, how do I hold a healthy, good brain state for myself? How do I keep my pieces? I keep moving the ball down the field to keep those goals. So, exactly, yeah. exactly. But Terry, this has been great. Mark is also saying thank you for the information. It was um, very informative for him as well. Um, this has been really, really great. And it's a lot of um, opportunity for us to go back and maybe have conversations with those that we work with, yeah. as well as maybe some of our leaders to tap into um um, what they could be doing better, what, you know, just different things that we can um, figure out and how to be able to communicate and be inclusive 
and um, make sure we're creating an environment of belonging for everyone. Definitely. I'm happy to stay on for a minute. If people are just thanking, that's fine. If there are yeah. questions, so yeah. Holly, there is actually a question that's come in. Did you catch that one? Oh, okay. I see. I just, I didn't roll up. Okay. Just, right. Okay. So on the, uh, Teresa's asking, on the example that you gave of the student who was not happy with their professor as it related to the personal agency, what were the specific suggestions that you gave to that student? Yeah. So we talked a lot actually about why they were feeling so emotionally hijacked by the experience first, right? Like the first thing we did was unpack what were the what were the stories they were telling themselves about their own self worth, right? How valid was the that that narrative about I you know this person thinks I'm dumb <laughs> when this person really had no data to know whether that student was dumb or not? Um, you know, uh, there's a concept that I you know we just I, I could talk about this stuff for days, obviously, right? There's a concept called the ladder of inference. Um, uh, uh, Holly, I'll let you type that, in, type that into the chat if you would. It's the ladder of inference, right? Um, and anybody could look that up as well. Um, and it's this idea that we take little pieces of data when something happens to us and we infer certain things about it. So I actually drew out a ladder of inference for that student that day and I had them think through what were the pieces of data from the professor's behavior that led them to quickly climb that ladder and come to a conclusion that this guy already hated him, was out for him, and had no intention of making sure that he had a good experience in the class. And then we revisited strategies, really specific techniques for one, not letting that ladder of inference escalation occur as fast, right? Like how do you, you know, one of the ways I used to say to my students, like how do you just keep your chi down? How do you keep your energy down? When you start to feel yourself go like, boop, 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 boop. oh no, he did not. Um, and then we had some concrete techniques, right? Like, like you were going to show up for every class when you needed an attaboy. You were going to come see me, and I was going to pat you on the back and tell you that you were you were doing good for sticking with it, right? Um, you know, um, I also set up some very concrete times to meet with that student to review some of their work in advance with them as an advisor, and just make sure that they felt seen and heard. What I didn't want to do is be dismissive. Right. Like I and I think that's one of the most powerful things I learned as an executive too, long before I was a teacher, is that when somebody presents something to me, the most important thing I can do is really try to honor their story, their perception, not be dismissive, and then help figure out how do we come to a middle ground. In this case with the student, I could focus on agency because they paid to sit in that class. There was value in what they were going to learn in that class. I did not want them to lose that value just because they were going to take themselves off of a bus that they were really the driver of the bus on, right? In, in some instances, we don't have that level of authority and control. So, you know, I think it is somewhat circumstantial. But for any of you that have college-age students um, or have had uh, high school students who have had a similar narrative, this is, as you can tell, equally applicable from a parenting perspective. Or if any of you are teaching as adjuncts, right? Um, you know, many of you probably drop into a classroom periodically. Um, lots of ways to help students think through their their quick climb to a conclusion that ultimately undermines their long term goals. You know, same as an athlete. Athlete metaphors help a lot with students. It, it, many of my students were athletes, and they like that idea of you know, are you playing a long game here? What's the playbook look like when you let the professor run defense on you essentially and bully you out of being in a classroom. Sounds like they just pulled a defensive play that you need to get back on the field and run a stronger offense again. Okay, so we have another question, Jonathan Crane. In a country where some of our politicians promote hate and intolerance, how can we communicate that we would rather be a positive influence for diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think one that all of us are going to continue to wrestle with. Um, I, you know, I think that, that how to have a voice and lean into conversations about race, that first video that I posted there, she offers some very, very concrete ways to start to talk about race. And I still, you know, I, this is just my personal opinion. I think we still have a long way to go to feel comfortable talking with people about race, right? To ask our, to ask our, our friends of different backgrounds what their lived experiences are in a way that feels like it's safe and we're not making them responsible for teaching us right like mm -hmm. and, and and i think we've got to we've got to figure out how to navigate those conversations by asking other people how they want us to navigate those conversations um 
I also just use a lot of I statements. I say things all the time, like I am really committed to trying to do better around conversations with race. And if I do something that that you find offensive or difficult or that you wish I had done differently, please, please share that with me in a way that, you know, you best feel comfortable sharing that with me if you can. You know, I don't care if you slide an anonymous note under my door or, you know, send me a a message or ask to have coffee. Like, let's figure out a way for me to get the feedback I need. One final mm -hmm. point I'll make about that, um, and this is, again, another whole topic that I could speak to. I think especially, um, I saw this first and most frankly in higher ed, um, a, a term that I have uh, coined, which some people don't like, but it's kind of this concept of same washing, where, where it is it is easy sometimes to lump a whole group together. Like in higher ed, I would see it a lot when people say, well, faculty, right? Like all faculty are the same. And I think not all faculty are the same, some faculty, right? Or they would say, well, administration, well, some administrators, right? Or or we would say all those lacrosse players, well, some of the lacrosse players, right? <laughs> or, you know, and I think as a, understandably, right, we navigate the world by finding associations and like things. So our brains, from an evolutionary perspective, are wired to lump us all together and to make associations that then will help keep us safe. But as effective humans, we have to peel off that same washing that our brains tend to do. And we have to be able to say, like, what do you want as a human, right? Like, I have learned that that not all of my black friends all feel the same, right? Any more than all of my white friends all feel the same. And and I think that I've tried to do a better job at having conversations with a person who I work with and say, how can I best support you? Or what do you feel like I need to hear from you? And then not fall into the trap of same washing, making sure I ask that question at every other point of opportunity where I potentially need to ask it to inform a rich story in my head and not one story that's a generalization because I asked one question at one point and think now I know, right? And that'll be a lifelong discipline for me. I still sometimes by accident say faculty when I should be saying some faculty, right? When I'm on a consulting engagement. But I think being careful of when our brains want to trick us into that safety by association and helping us think through like, ooh, I just fell into that again, Terry, back it off a little bit. Let me not make that assumption and let me come in and ask a better question. Make sure I have yeah. something here. Great. Lori made a comment about just great information. Thank you for explaining personal agency. I've never heard the expression before. I've heard the expression before, but never knew what it meant. Also stepping out on the, to the balcony. It's great advice. Thank you. I do have a question from Samuel. Can you adopt techniques such as mindfulness, deep breathing, and cognitive behavioral strategies, as well as developing emotional intelligence and self-awareness? Yes, to all those things, right? Um, the first video that I posted, she talks about a technique where you take a deep breath and settle yourself. And I think that the connection between mind and body is incredibly powerful. Um, and, and um, you know, I certainly use personally a lot of breathing and focus techniques. This is one silly little one, but I'll just teach everybody real quick who's ever still here, right? So um, often when you have a neural loop that's running and you're hijacked, right, or you're, you're a, a worry loop or an anxiety loop or whatever that loop is, literally, like if we hooked you up to electrodes, we could see the loop in your brain that was red and going like wherever that was firing, right? And one of the tricks that you can use to help interrupt a loop if you have started to hyperfire like that is to just do something that triggers the left side of your brain and the right side of your brain. Something as simple as tapping the, like I'm gonna take this hand and tap, I'll do it above the camera, right? But if I took this hand and just gently tap the opposite knee and then took this hand and just tap the opposite, the opposite knee on the opposite side, I have just caused my left and right hemispheres to cross interact neurologically and even that little intervention can stop a neural loop that has started mm. to escalate, right? Mm. There are times where I'm in meetings where I'm just gently like tapping left thigh, right thigh, left thigh, right thigh with the opposite side of my head to remind my brain to stay calm and settled. But absolutely mindfulness. Goldman's work on emotional intelligence. He did some fabulous Google talks that are out on YouTube that you can resource. Anybody who wants any more resources about any of these things, please feel free to send me a message on LinkedIn. 
I'm happy to drop a, a deeper dive into any of the resources for anybody who who likes uh, who'd like more information. So yeah. Okay. I have um another question. I wonder if CBT strategies would be best, or if actually DBT strategies may be more effective in mitigating the brain from going all or nothing thought patterns in one direction or another. Yeah, all, all, there's all kinds of techniques. And for those of you that don't know what those techniques are, you can you can look them up, BBT, right? There's And especially when you start looking into research on um, trauma and brain resets on trauma, there are some really fabulous techniques that you can learn to do at home. Um, there's a wonderful book There's a um, called The Body Keeps the Score. Uh, uh, one of the lead researchers who did early work on mind-body connection around trauma is a guy named uh, Bessel van der Kolk. And he wrote a body called, book called The Body Keeps the Score. And he has some great webinars that you can look at and read to that talk about, you know, neurofeedback, those kinds of, of um, uh, techniques that you can use around language, around thought to help to start to reprogram the brain. And I think it's just important to remember that one size does not fit all here either, right? Like, Mm -hmm. We're all going to have different techniques that resonate with different people in different ways. It's why it's helpful as a leader sometimes, I think, to have a bag of tricks, right? <laughs> like that you can sort of pull out from your bag. And, and I've always encouraged students or people that work for me, like, look, if I toss something across the net that doesn't work, you're, I'm not going to feel bad. No, no judgment. You know, it, like, you let me know that was useless and you ask me for something else if you want and we'll try again. So um, I think awesome. absolutely all of those all of those options are are good options. And the trauma research, if you start to research anything about trauma and the brain, um, there's fabulous techniques that are now slowly evolving and being developed to help us all learn how to sort of be in a better brain state and just keep our peace and live better lives. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks again, Terry. Greatly appreciate. Uh, you're giving us this time this afternoon. Um, it was an awesome presentation. Um, again, thank you from um, our participants who are participating. As a reminder, we will have this video posted onto our website. Um, and Terry had uh, provided her information for you to reach out to her. If you have any questions, if you want more resources or anything that she discussed today, feel free, free to reach out to Terry directly. Um, but I do thank you again, and thank I hope you, everyone, Terry. thank you. Thanks again, Terry. This Thanks. has been everybody awesome. Everybody have a great day. Thanks for all the work you're doing out in higher ed, too. Big jobs. They matter. Thank you.